Welcome, everyone, uh, and greetings from the Cheney Spokane chapter of the Ice Age Floods Institute. I'm Melanie Bell. I'm the president of this chapter. Uh, Dr. Linda McCollum, our presenter tonight, uh, will discuss the Cheney Scabland Track Scour Lakes. You're in for a real treat. Dr. McCollum received her BS and MS from the University of California at Davis and her PhD from Binghamton. Uh, University in New York State. She retired in 2017 after 35 years teaching at Eastern Washington University. She and her husband, Mike, continue to study the flood features in the vicinity of Spokane and Cheney. The first hour of this Zoom presentation will be Dr. McCollum's lecture, followed by about 15 minutes of questions and answers. So uh, we try to stay with around about an hour and 15 minutes, but if there are continued questions, we'll stay open uh, as long as we need to. So on behalf of the board of directors, I present to you, Dr. Linda McCollum. My original talk had serious technical difficulties, so I had to re-record it. The overall aim was to convey to the audience that the questions may appear to be simple and straightforward, like, how did the Missoula flood lakes form and why aren't they distributed more uniformly throughout the Scavland tracks? The answer is always more complex than you'd hoped, often covering aspects from different scientific disciplines, requiring some review of basic earth science background information that you may have been exposed to in middle school, but haven't thought about since. Uh, all this review material coupled with new information within a one hour format dictates a lecture style rather than a more leisurely uh, discussion that you are used to seeing in this series. So sit back in your chairs and fasten your seat belts for a high speed and somewhat bumpy ride as we surf the Missoula flood down the Cheney Palouse tract. Remember, you have a pause button on the left side of your screen if you begin to feel overwhelmed. The enormity of channel scavland development across the Columbia Plateau and the widespread distribution of scoured lakes within them led J. Harlan Bretz to hypothesize in 1923 that these features could only be formed by an immense flood. In the intervening century since Bretz started his scabland research, we have come to realize that there is a long history of floods attributed to catastrophic outbursts from the ice dam on Glacial Lake Missoula. Tonight's entertainment is an updated and expanded version of a scientific talk that I presented at the annual Geological Society of America meeting in Portland, Oregon in the fall of 2009. Some additional aspects are covered in our Cheney Spokane chapters, IAFI field trip guide compendiums. Contact Melanie Bell if you are interested in seeing those. In this talk, I simplify the regional bedrock geology for a more complete understanding of these rocks. You may consult the Geology of Washington Beyond Volume Chapter Seven, which was published in 2016. My husband, Mike, and I have decided to present a series of talks on the importance of understanding and applying scientific method to well-established hypotheses found within the framework of the Missoula floods and channeled Scabland story. The hypothesis that we're uh, evaluating in this talk is that Missoula flood flow hydrodynamics dictate whether rock basin lakes would form either by unidirectional or helical flow, helical flow being uh, whirlpools and uh, tornadoes, that sort of thing. While geology was the major factor in respect to location and geomorphology of the larger pothole and linear lakes, I, I will begin with a generalized review of flood sculpted bed forms found within the more iconic areas such as the potholes, coulee, and dry falls. This will be followed by comparing two typical rock basin lakes uh, in the channel Scablands, Williams Lake and Badger Lake, and then I will continue northward to the West Plains. Lake formation is dependent on the interplay between hydrology and geology. Therefore, this talk is set up to explain how that interplay is responsible for the location and geometry of our local lakes. Now we're gonna begin with a brief review of ideas, observations, and causative factors evoked by others, uh, mainly Bretz and Vic Baker. And we'll follow that by our observations, conclusions, and hypothesis testing. We tried to keep it simple. However, some subjects discussed like fluid flow dynamics will be unfamiliar to you. Hang in there, you'll grow to love it. Uh, general location map, 
we're going to be focusing in on this area just south of Glacial Lake Columbia and the upper end of the Chinicaloose Scabland Tract. This is an air photo of the northern Chinicaloose Scabland Tract of this study area that I'm going to be discussing. The first lakes I'll talk about will be Williams and Badger Lakes. And then later I'll move up into the Medical Lakes area and finally with Fish Lake. Note that all the lakes within this region are long and thin and oriented parallel to the flow of the uh, Ice Age floods. What caused the day ice dam to break? Well, there's several hypotheses out there, but my money's on Sprat. The emphasis of this talk is on pre-flood geologic conditions that control the size and distribution of the Scour Lakes formed in the uppermost portion of the Chini Blue Scabland Tract, uh, followed by a discussion of paleo flow dynamics. The most impressive erosional forms created by the Missoula floods are probably the abandoned dry cataracts. But first I wanna talk a little bit about erosional processes. Sediment transport and erosion are two of the most important flow factors when discussing the hydrodynamics of lake formation. There are two main types of sediment transport. Bed load along the bottom, the biggest particles are rolled along the bottom and somewhat smaller ones are kind of bounced along the bottom. And then there's suspension uh, particles that uh, stay within the flow of the water above the bottom. There are two main types of stream current flows unidirectional or downstream, that's the main one, but there's also helical or rotational eddies and vortices, things like that. Unidirectional flow results in abrasion and plucking. Uh, abrasion occurs when rock particles strike each other or bedrock, a process that results in the rounding of angular class and the smoothing of bedrock. This is a slow repetitious process occurring in rivers today, which is sped up by flash floods However, the enormity of the glacial outburst floods that created the scablands and lakes was accompanied, accomplished by plucking, uh, the ripping out of fractured bedrock. Unidirectional or downstream flow uh, most commonly causes scour abrasion, again, a process that results in the rounding of angular class and either smoothing or grooving of bedrock. Colks and maelstrom are helical or rotational flows that can pluck large chunks of fractured basalt, forming potholes undermining basalt colonnades, causing rock basins and cataracts, in addition to transporting material upward into suspension. It might, here's an example of a maelstrom uh, taking some pirate ships down. The largest of the subaqueous or vortices is the maelstrom, a powerful whirlpool present in the ocean and rivers of today. We believe maelstroms created the large potholes at the base of recessional cataracts. Note that much of the literature on the Missoula floods erroneously calls them plunge pools, which refers to the aerial plunge of water from the lip of a waterfall, and they aren't the same thing at all. Looking at a helical vortex from the side, and you can kind of see uh, the fact that the rotation is upward, it, it lifts particles. Uh, an example that everybody is probably familiar with is the tornado that lifted Dorothy's house and took her to Oz. Uh, the colks and maelstrom, colks are small, maelstroms are large, same basic phenomenon, size difference. Their upward directed quasi-helical vertical flow dislodges, picks up and transports sediments up to boulder size, dispersing this material on outward directed boils into suspension, larger material dropping back to the floor. Colts are thought to have created the small circular potholes while I believe that maelstrom sized helical flows form the larger scour pools below the recessional cataracts. A colk is an underwater vortex, similar to a whirlwind capable of dislodging, picking up and moving boulders. The term was first applied in 1902, introduced to America in 1947, and applied to erosional flood features in the channel scablands by J. Harlan Bretz in 1956. By 1956, Bretz and others came to realize that the recessional cataracts were not formed by waterfalls, undercutting and collapsing the cliff face by horizontal vortices within the plunge pool, 
but by plucking the cataract cliff face by Colks. Dry Falls recessional cataract retreated 20 miles up flow while completely submerged, therefore no waterfall except for a relatively short time during the flood's final draining period. Colk boils are large paired vortices found in channel flows today and no doubt existed within the Missoula flood flows carving out the channel scab lands. They are of interest here because colt boils actively scour the bedrock at their base, transporting the plucked material upward by its helical motion, like an Archimedes screw, to the surface and then transporting this material laterally within the boils, only to be dropped back into the main flow where it's transported either to slack water areas to be deposited as gravel bars or removed from the channel completely and out to sea. The helical form has two counter-rotating vortices one at the top is clockwise, and the one at the bottom is counterclockwise. Both are capable of scouring out bedrock to form rock basin lakes and can scale up in size from colt to maelstrom. Dipole vortices often occur as long paired strings forming numerous small rock basin lakes simultaneously over a large area. This is an actual photograph of these paired vortices strung together in a stream channel. In 1978, Vic Baker proposed the now classical sequence of erosional bed forms needed for the development of the rock basin lakes within the channel scab lands, beginning with large longitudinal grooves, then widening into rock basins with headward erosion and ending with potholes at the base of recessional cataracts. According to Vic Baker in 2016, Bretz noticed this feature on a newly released topographic map back in 1909 and wondered how this now dry ancient cataract could have been formed without an obvious river course le leading to it. A dozen years later, he would have an opportunity to visit this and many other sites. The rest is history. This is an ortho photo of the potholes coulee. The blue arrows denote flow direction. The elongated lakes on the right or the east over here are man-made reservoirs filling rock basins. Note the pothole lakes in front of the cataracts down over here. Uh, bathymetry of the classic pothole lakes, the ones in front of the cataracts. Note that the lake on the right has two depressions, indicative of a paired vertical flow. Now you can see the cause superimposed on the effect. It all makes sense. Vertical flow, two holes. The two potholes form simultaneously from a single paired maelstrom. A uh, three-dimensional view of the area gives maybe a better perspective on what's going on. We have the potholes here, headward erosion. Dry Falls State Park is a classical sequence of erosional bed forms from longitudinal grooves to potholes and cataracts. So here we have longitudinal grooves. We have a cataract here. We have large pothole lakes down there and a number of smaller lakes on the upper surface of Dry Falls. Longitudinal grooves are flow parallel incised grooves formed longitudinally in bedrock channels by the Missoula floods. They develop in the first phase of rock basin erosion. A uh, close up view of longitudinal grooves and small potholes. When the small aligned potholes within the dashed yellow line uh, merge, a rock basin would form. Pothole lakes come in large and small. Numerous small pothole clusters are formed by individual and paired colks. Cataract potholes of great size are formed by maelstroms. And here's a number of pothole lakes uh, in an area west of Medical Lake. Uh, three distinct lakes with a large, within a large pothole basin in the pothole coulee. By 1956, Bretts and others recognized that many of the cataracts were formed subaqueously of below flowing water by colks rather than by the plunge pool undercutting classically illustrated by Niagara Falls. The flow hydrodynamics found to cause headward erosion in waterfalls is different from those that caused headward erosional retreat in the Scabland Dry Falls. The Niagara Falls cataract formed when river water plummeted over a precipice into a plunge pool where horizontal vortices undermine and collapse the subaerially formed rocks Dry Falls was completely submerged, therefore no waterfall. This is a diagrammatic comparison of the two helical flow scenarios for the cre creation of a recessional cataract. In the case of the waterfall depicted on the right of your screen, 
horizontal helical flows are generated by the free fall water into a plunge pool where cliff erosion is primarily by undercutting and collapse. This results in a large rubble zone at the foot of the cataract and surrounding the plunge pool. The vertical cult boil vortices depicted on the left over here erodes the entire length of the cliff, which is completely submerged. The abraded and plucked material is carried off by the vortices and therefore the pothole lake is not surrounded by collapsed debris as in the waterfall example. The following clip is from Nick Zentner's Nick on the Rock series on PBS. His animation is quite dramatic, but it just shows the flow of water at the very beginning of the flood, which quickly filled the Grand Coulee with water for days, if not weeks, during which Dry Falls was completely submerged. Therefore, the waterfall scenario for erosion would have occurred only during the first few hours at the beginning of the flood and for a similar amount of time, time at the end as the flood wanes below the rim of Dry Falls. The actual formation of the recessional, recessional cataract would be the result of cold boil vortices and not by undercutting and collapse of the typical waterfall. I believe this is an opinion that is widely held among the ranks of Missoula flood researchers. Dry Falls Cataract is probably the most famous and highly visited cataract in the channel Scablands. The estimated flood depth of 350 feet above its 400 foot high cliff and 750 feet depth at its base amassed enough macro, macro turbulence to spawn dozens of colts along the length of the Great Cataract Group, a term coined by Bretts to include the Dry Falls Monument and Deep Lake Coolies. The headward migration distances for these cataracts is estimated to be at least 20 miles. Remember that this extreme headward erosion was the result of many separate Missoula mega floods over a few thousand years. A topographic map of Dry Falls, here you can see several Colt scour depressions called potholes, sometimes erroneously called plunge pools. Note the shape of these lakes. They tend to be more or less round unless they're up against the wall of the, the cataract. The head of Dry Falls Lake is horseshoe shaped, while the back portion is elongate with a rock channel. Note that Umatilla Rock in the south central portion of this feature is what's known as a rock blade, basically a thin, long, thin line of rock that has been eroded away on both sides. So now we're gonna move over the Cheney Scabland uh, tract and look at Williams and Badger Lakes first. How are these two lakes created? So let's look around the area for the diagnostic bed forms that Vic Baker associated with lake formations. So here's Williams Lake, Badger Lake, there's cataracts and pothole lakes in between them a gravel bar here where some of the sediment was deposited and a series of longitudinal grooves down here. So here are the longitudinal grooves. Looking in between the two lakes, again, Williams Lake here, Badger Lake here, we have a couple of uh, cataracts. They're known as the Suey Cataract and the Williams Lake Cataract. I decided to restrict the name Williams Lake for the submerged cataract, the head of that lake right up in here. Uh, the Perch Cataract 2,500 feet to the northeast is really a rare geomorphic phenomenon and deserves a proper moniker. I thus uh, call it the Badwill Cataract using the first few letters from both Badger and Williams Lake. Uh, getting back to uh, this, so we have the Suey Cataract over here, the Badwill Cataract there. Getting back to the main point, these are two of the finest examples of re recessional cataracts to be found in the northern portion of the Chini Palouse Scabland Tract. The Suey Cataract is located on private land, and the one existing road into it is gated and locked. Thus, I've had no access to this feature and cannot discuss it further. The city of Chini owns a parcel of land just above the rim of Badwell Cataract, so there's public access as far as, as of this talk. Looking at the Badwheel Cataract between Badger and Williams Lake, right here, we have streamlined Luss Hills off to the side, uh, which have erosional shorelines at 2,450 feet, which is 400 feet above the water surface of Williams Lake. So looking at the geology of the area, the lowest unit is the Grand Ronde Basalt. It is overlain by the Wanapum Basalt, which is the highest basalt unit in the Spokane or Eastern Washington area. In between these two basalt formations, there is, was enough time for a lake to form, which creates very soft, easily erodible sediment. And the surface 
of the Badwill Cataract recessional area is on that uh, Grand Ronde surface, eroding out that layer in between the two. Uh, this is a view of the cataract alcove north of Williams Lake that we're calling the Badwill Cataract. It is eroded along the surface of the top of the Grand Ronde basalt through the uh, sediments that were deposited between it and the overlying uh, Wanapum basalt. It undercuts the basalt of the Wanapum and causes colonnade collapse and also cult plucking. Either way would cause headward erosion. So here again is a look at the pothole lakes. There are actually two of them uh, from the wheel, uh, rim of the Bad Wheel Cataract. And one of Bruce B. Ornstadt's uh, shots uh, looking over the Bad Wheel Cataract and down and here's uh, Williams Lake in the distance. So looking at the two lakes, they're within the same erosional channel where hydrodynamic factors are similar and rock type is the same. Badger and Williams Lake are less than a mile apart. Other than one lake is upflow from the other, the hydrologic factors affecting their formation should be almost identical. All things being equal, these two lakes should be quite similar. What are they? So let's compare the two lakes based on their geomorphology, which is mainly the shape and bathymetry. And then we'll take a closer look at the geology. In this case, the basalt formations that the lakes developed in. So these two lakes are about a mile apart and they're in the same channel. So it can be assumed that the flood flow velocity was the same for both and the water depth was similar at any given moment. Each lake is steep sided and about the same overall length and depth. Individual basalt flows average about 100 feet and the maximum lake depths are close to this number also. The most obvious difference is that Badger Lake is uh, rather sinuous, whereas Williams Lake is rather linear in look. We'll start with Williams Lake. As already mentioned, the lake is fairly linear. It's wider in the middle portion and somewhat horseshoe shaped up its upper end. Let's look at lake bathymetry. The deepest part of the lake is at the north end up here at over 100 feet deep. The contours converge, which suggests a steep cliff. Had this basin not been filled with water, you would call it a cataract and give it an appropriate name like Williams Lake where it resides. That's why I don't wish to reply to apply this name to the Perch Cataract 2,500 feet northeast. Badger Lake, on the other hand, does not have a basin at its head. In fact, it kind of tapers out to the north end. Therefore, there's no evidence that this rock basin was formed by a recessional cataract. In addition, note its highly sinuous shape. You might also note the series of lines that run perpendicular to the lake through here in particular. These lines on the orthophoto were fractures. In fact, the Chini fracture zone cuts right through the middle of this area. The highest intensity of fracturing occurs to the middle of the zone and Badger Lake formed there. The fracture zone exists due to regional stress, but no offset in the rocks is apparent. If you offset the rocks, it becomes a fault, not a fracture. Fracture rocks can be removed through plucking as floodwaters come through the area. Uh, a contour map of the lake depth of bathymetry. Deepest point is in the center of the lake and about two thirds of the way toward the southern end. This is due to erosional undermining and collapse of basalt colonnades. Uh, what's the importance of fracture zones? Uh, they differentially enhance plucking, causing sinuosity in lakes. So here are the Chini Palouse Scavland tracks, Chini Fracture Zone coming through, Badger Lake right in the bullseye. You know, some other lakes through here and over here are also fairly sinuous as they pass through the, uh, the Chini Fracture Zone. And Chini Fracture Zone again, right through the middle of Badger Lake, Williams Lake not affected by it. Our comparison of the shape and, shape and bathymetry of Williams and Badger Lake reveals that sinuosity is due to fracture zones and the location of scour holes suggests two basic types of rock basin lake geometry. First, recessional cataracts, and second, mid-channel depressions caused by undermining basalt colonnades within a gently sloping basin. So this is to introduce a term. The term is step toes. This is step toe butte. Uh, step toes is a hill of basement rock, the oldest rock in an area surrounded by basalts. So now we've compared two lakes and we're giving us a good grounding and cause and effect in our study of rock basin lakes. So now we're going to move up to north of the promised land and look among the step toes for lakes. 
So here's our study area now, basin satellite image of Spokane area. Uh, we focus on the lakes within the step toes in the white box near the head of the westernmost flood pass of the Cheney Pool Scabland tract. First lake we're going to place we're going to look is around this lake, which is Silver Lake, the largest of the lakes in this particular area. The pink lines here are drainage divides. And you'll notice that the lakes are often near the heads of the drainage divides, which is pretty unusual. Uh, looking at an ortho photo map of the area, uh, the lakes are all labeled in white here. And the drainage divides are in blue in this particular map. Uh, note the lakes are often in different subbasins, although they are in the same Scabland channel, particularly this one right here, in which most of the lakes are located, but we have uh, two different subbasins involved. The lakes that we're looking at are located within bedrock at the upper reaches of drainage divides, and none are formed by glaciers or have been subsequently modified by flowing streams. In fact, there are no flowing streams in this region at all. The lack of ongoing modification, except that which is easily attributed to man, leaves us with a series of natural features unchanged since their formation by Lake Missoula outburst floods between 14,500 and 18,000 years ago. Uh, this is an orthophoto map of the lakes among the Steptoes region. I'll be using it to, as a location map for the rest of this talk. Uh, the Steptoes are in white, the towns are in yellow. So from here on, we're going to look at flood lake formation. This is the fun part, and we'll start by looking at the usual factors and then the usual suspects. Starting with looking at some of the smaller lakes, I'm dividing them into two categories circular versus irregularly shaped lakes. This is the north end of Silver Lake, City of Medical Lake there. We'll start by looking at this irregularly shaped lake in the box here, and then we'll move on to these more circular boxes, lakes up here. The irregularly shaped box is uh, in a Medical Lake fracture zone, uh, a series of fractures forming a conjugate fracture system. A 30-60 fracture zone is the way fractures will naturally form, and it shows up very nicely in this particular set of fractures. Note what we call conjugate lake formed by plucking basalt at the intersection of two fracture angles right here. And a closer look at uh, conjugate lake. And here it is with the fracture zones highlighted in blue. Now we'll move north to the other set of lakes. Uh, you see they're very round. And uh, we have this weird feature here, which you probably wouldn't know about. It's kind of a strange one. Uh, these are a series of small circular lakes. This side story here of this feature here is that it's an old irrigation ditch from the Hazelwood Irrigated Farms fiasco of the early 1900s. Some developers divided the area between Silver Lake and Airway Heights, which is just off the map to the north, into a series of small farms and advertised them nationwide. Their water source was Silver Lake. A geologist had assured them that the lake was fed by underwater springs and the water source was inexhaustible. And if anybody out there knows of a truly inexhaustible source of any natural resource, I'd be curious to hear about it. Anyway, the farms grew fruit trees, strawberries, and other similar crops. Within about 15 years, Silver Lake had been drained and no springs were revealed, not one. For a number of years, people were growing wheat on the bed of Silver Lake. The lake didn't fill up again until about 1950. The farms tried drilling wells, but could not get the volume of water they needed, and they all eventually failed. Circular lake formation, sometimes referred to as pothole lakes, are formed by a vertical rotational flow called a vortex or colk. The greatest rotational strength is at the base of the vortex, where it comes into contact with the underlying rock. The sheer forces of the flow causes plucking at the surface of the basalt, and sets in rotational motion the angular boulders known as grinders that scour out the circular depression. This is a computer generated model of vortices in a fluid media. The colors of the vortices reflects clockwise versus counterclockwise flow. And you'll notice that it's fairly common for clockwise and counterclockwise flows to be paired. Here's an example, here's another example right here and even up here. So we often see that pattern. I've talked about it earlier in this talk. Uh, here, since the basalt does not appear to be highly fractured and these small circular lakes tend to be paired, the explanation must be scour scouring by coke boils. And you notice they are often paired in this picture. 
And again, remember this from earlier in the talk, this is the sort of thing that caused these uh, small lakes north of Silver Lake. This is a view from Olson Hill, which is uh, north of uh, Medical Lake, eastward to Riddle and Wrights Hill, Riddle Hill, Wrights Hill, Silver Lake through here. One side of Silver Lake is granite, the other side is basalt. Geologic map of this Northern Silver Lake area. Medical Lake proper is over here. Here's Olson Hill where that picture was taken. Riddle Hill down here. The red represents granite. The dark green represents metamorphic rock. Those collectively are forms of basement. And the yellow is alluvium, the brown, uh, grayish brown color here, grayish, I guess, is basalt. And this light green is wetlands. The rest of the colors don't much matter. Rock cut or scour basins form when catastrophic floods uh, can form them as a result of the action of fast running water currents causing large slabs or blocks of rock to move in a circular vortex motion, eroding the natural rock substrate to create large concavities. Repeated floods can increase the depth and circumference over time, forming slots into bedrock ridges and finally cutting through them. The key evidence for this type of erosion are large grinders, boulders showing percussion marks, but no rounding piled against the bedrock wall or found in piles downstream. So we're gonna focus now on this particular part of the Northern Silver Lakes area. And here's the close up of the map again, red is granite, the green is metamorphic rock and this yellow is wetlands. Do you see a possible rock cut basin? Well, there's several of them here, but the one I particularly wanna point out is this one right here, which has a wetland in it. So here is an example of some rock cut basins on orthophotopod. We're gonna focus particularly on this one right here with its wetland, although you see several others coming through here and here. And we're gonna look at a lake that formed in this particular wetland next. Here's the lake, uh, it formed an erosional channel. There's a migrating cult that cut into the, the granite cliff. Uh, granite exposure at the edge of the rock cut basin, you notice the jointing is sub-horizontal here, and that allows the floodwaters to more easily pluck the rock free and use it as grinders. Uh, grinders lying in a concentric circle at the southern end of the rock-filled basin. And here's Gene Kiever sitting on one of the grinders writing up his observations. Thus, fractures aren't the whole story in terms of where and why Scabland lakes form. Let's take a larger view of this area and see if we can ascertain what other factors might be involved. Let's start with topography and then more on the local geology and then back to flow dynamics. So looking at the usual factors, we'll start with bedrock geology, dividing in two categories, basement, which is the step toes, and basalt, which is the Scablands. Uh, generalized geologic map of the area we're looking at. Again, red is granite. This green is metamorphic rocks. This orange and brownish colors are quartzite. All of that collectively is part of the basement, the oldest rocks in the area. The gray is the basalt, and that's the main features that we need to worry about here. This dotted line through here is a, is a fault. So basalt cooling, what should we know about basalts? First, they differ internally because they cool at different rates. The average flow is about 100 feet thick and it cools faster at the top and bottom than it does in the middle. So they crystallize differently depending on where they are in the flow. Uh, they have different chemistry, different flows have different chemistry, different gas content, different viscosity, et cetera. What we are most interested in this talk is weathering and resistance to erosion by floodwaters. So here are a few factors to keep in mind. The structure of basalt flow. We have the colonnades at the bottom, overlain by the entablature, which is highly fractured rock, although it's pretty welded together. And the top is vesicular basalt, which is full of holes uh, where the gas bubbles have escaped from the basalt flow. Notice that although the entablature uh, portion of basalt flow is highly fractured during the cooling of the flow, the fractures remain highly welded and therefore pretty resistant to weathering and less erodible than the underlying colonnades. The boundary between the colonnades and the entablature is often quite abrupt. 
Uh, columns are very dense and solid and don't erode easily, but they can be undercut and toppled, and they often have horizontal fractures that make them more easily broken up. The highly fractured entablature is much more resistant to erosion. Undercutting columns is one way to topple them, and again, they have these horizontal fractures that can make them fall apart. Structure, faults, and fractures, we've already covered this to a large extent. The faults and fractures shown here on, in black are from the Spokane 1 to 100,000 map published by the state in 1990. Uh, this is a fault from the Spokane map. The blue is, is faults and fractures that we've mapped since that time, and the pink are the drainage boundaries. Looking at weathering, there are two major types of weathering, chemical and physical weathering. Uh, Chemical weathering occurs when substrate subsurface fluids alter the minerals within the rock to a residuum. Physical weathering occurs by fracturing rocks without changing them chemically. The most relevant process in this discussion is the chemical weathering of basalts and granites that results in flood water uh, more easily remove and transport away the residuum and underlying weakened bedrock, leaving a scoured surface denuded of soil. The land surface of the West Plains is a mixture of flood scoured bedrock, flood deposits, and remaining residuum and lust. A deeply weathered granite on the west shore of Medical Lake, it's almost a sand, which is of course easily removed by flood waters. Spheroidal weathering. Spheroidal weathering is a very common type of weathering in both basalts and granites. Weathering occurs on surfaces, and there's more surface area at a corner than there is on a flat face. So corners weather more rapidly, which tends to cause rocks to round, and that's spheroidal weathering. These are a couple of spheroidal boulders of granite on the west shore of Medical Lake. Basalt differential weathering, this lower part of the basalt unit is, is weaker toward weathering and is weathering much faster than the upper part. Here's a spheroidal basalt boulder uh, falling out of an outcrop. Since this picture was taken, this boulder has fallen all the way down into this little drainage ditch. Pillow basalts form when a lava flow flows into water. If you want to see film of pillow basalts forming today, there's a lot of really nice YouTube video of Kilauea basalt flows going into the ocean. I, I highly recommend looking at them. They're very interesting. But when they flow into water, there's a chemical reaction between the water and the lava that creates zones of alteration that are easily weathered. Basalt uh, forms a deeply weathered saprolite clay that is a brownish color and is often mistaken uh, for Lataw formation, which is the uh, lake sediments that form between basalt flows. This particular outcrop, which was used to line uh, the Graham Road landfill still has vesicle holes preserved in it, uh, showing that it is indeed basalt and not a elata or anything like that. So lake formation and location, we'll look at a sojourn from lake to lake. This is a figure courtesy of Bruce Bjornstadt that shows the pattern of flood water flows through the Steptoe region. The light blue arrows are the pattern of basin flow. The flood submerged areas are in green, and the emergent uh, hills and ridge tops, or the step toes, are in brown to white. Lake by lake analysis, we're going to go through all of these lakes in order. Easy targets for catastrophic flood erosion include removal of unconsolidated sediment and weathered bedrock, sediment interlayers between basalt flows, we saw that at Williams and Williams Lake and deeply weathered contact zone between granites, acidic rock, and basalt or basic rock. I will start with basalt basement contacts. Rarely do you see basalt and granite in contact. When you do, the rocks are highly altered. Granite goes to decomposed granite and the basalt to clay. Why? What effect do these deeply weathered contacts have on the location of flood formed lakes? Basalt is alkaline and basement is generally quartz rich, which has an acid chemistry. The area of contact between bedrock and step toes and basalts is often a depression, sometimes filled with flood or wetland deposits. Mike Hamilton has termed these depressions Durkee ditches in honor of Bob Durkee, who mapped these contacts in several seven and a half minute quadrangles in this region. And I've adopted this informal term. So we'll start with medical and West medical lakes looking at geology, orthophoto maps, topography, and lake bathymetry. 
So here's the geology reminder again. Uh, red is granite. This is the step toe between the two lakes. Uh, we informally call it Hospital Hill because the state hospital is up on that area. Uh, the basalt scab land around it, that's basalt there. And then this is also basement rocks, different uh, type, but it's very acid in contact. And here is the Durkee ditch in between the two. So here's uh, the orthophoto map, the granite up here, the Durkee ditch and the basalt scab land down there. Here's what the Durkee ditch looks like from the ground. It's often a low depression, a wetland feature like that. So looking at the orthophoto, we're gonna look at the topography and bathymetry of the two lakes, the hill in between, Medical Lake, West Medical Lake. Um, again, Hospital Hill line between the two, it's made of granite. This is basalt over here. And here's the bathymetry to fill out the geomorphology of this westernmost flood sculpted portion of our study area. Note that West Medical Lake has a great, much greater length, but a much shallower depth. It gets down to a little over 35 feet, and that's about it. 40 feet is maximum depth. Let's try to figure out why, what's going on here, and why does Medical Lake have such a steep side over here? First, Medical Lake. Note that the deepest part is on the east side of the lake. Uh, the reason is because this is the Dirkey Ditch area. We have granite over here for the Hospital Hill, basalt over here, and basalt colonnades are being undermined, so the deepest part is on the basalt side of the lake. Now, West Medical Lake has a fairly shallow, flat bottom, and the question becomes why on that? So let's look at a couple of cross sections of West Medical Lake, one running north-south, the other east-west. The left cross section is based on the published one to 100,000 map by Washington Department of Natural Resources. This map shows the bottom of West Medical Lake is simply basalt, with a fault on the west side against the quartzite that makes up Fancher Butte. The right cross section is based on our mapping around the lake, which is revealed that the granite extends under the lake and intersects the basalt on the west side of the lake, where it is faulted against the Cambrian quartzite. So it does fit the pattern of basalt against basement, igneous and metamorphic rock. Next, we go to Clear Lake. And here's Clear Lake down here. I noticed the hammerhead shape at the head of the lake and the north, and also how irregular the shoreline is at the south end. Also, why is there a linear lake here in the first place? Uh, note that Clear Lake deepens and becomes very cliffy to the north, but what could have caused the irregular shoreline shape? Some of you might have noticed that there is a fracture zone running through the north end of Clear Lake that causes the hammerhead shape at, shape at the head of the lake. Uh, reminiscent of what we saw at the head of Williams Lake. Uh, looking at the bathymetry again, and at the north end of Clear Lake is a scour depression typical of a cataract, again, very similar to the bathymetry of the submerged cataract at the head of Williams Lake proper. Uh, geologic map of the area. Now the answer to why a linear lake formed at this location. Remember that cataracts lakes formed by headward erosion this geologic map shows the Cambrian quartzite and shale down here, surrounded by basalt, is exposed in a hill at the south end of the lake where headward erosion would have begun. As we've seen in nearby lakes, they formed along the contact of chemically weathered granite and basalt. Likewise, the groundwater uh, would have become acidic due to the quartz-rich Cambrian rocks and then chemically altered the basic basalt. So here's the lower Cambrian quartzite formation, which is very resistant to erosion, forms a prominent hillock on the, between the lake shore and the road. A recreation area for Fairchild personnel on the east shore of the southern end of Clear Lake has a special meaning for me because of the discovery of Cambrian age, about 520 million year old fossils, mostly trilobites of exactly the same age I've been researching in the Great Basin of California and Nevada. This is the only site in the state of Washington that has yielded fossils from this early middle Cambrian biozone and the only fossiliferous Paleozoic era site ever discovered within the Columbia Plateau province. The discovery was made by Mike Hamilton when mapping with Bob Durkee and rocks previously interpreted as Proterozoic belt supergroup rocks, approximately one and a half billion years old, which is much too old to have body fossils. 
my husband Mike and I got interested in finding other localities like this, thus beginning a decade of geologic mapping that extended north from Cheney to Welpinit on the Spokane Indian Reservation and west to Davenport. Here is Mike Hamilton sitting on an outcrop of the quartzite not far from where he discovered trilobites and shale fragments excavated from a power pole. pole. Later, we discovered many additional specimens uh, from shale from a fairly recent excavation for a large septic tank near the parking lot. It was serendipitous as there were no natural exposures of the fossiliferous reddish brown shale. Next, we'll look at granite and willow lakes, examples of flood channel lakes cut through basement rocks. And they're right here, uh, willow lake and granite lake. These two lakes occupy a single scour bedrock channel that trends 45 degrees southwest, very similar to the north end of Silver Lake. Notice the steep sided channel walls leading up to the 2750 foot high Riddle Hill on the north over here, and the 2850 foot high Wrights Hill uh, to the south. The flood engorged Glacial Lake Columbia reached a 2620 foot surface level and therefore the emergent bedrock hills caused a flow constriction, which resulted in a more rapid flow called the Venturi effect. Note that Willow Lake, the northern one here, is shallow, so shallow you could walk across it. Uh, Granite Lake, however, has a deep scour hole right here. Uh, the igneous and metamorphic rock, basement rocks contain a variety of lithologies with different resistance to chemical and mechanical weathering. The granites tend to decompose by chemical weathering while the calc silicates, which look like a fine grained green quartzite are highly resistant. The bedrock geomorphic sill, a shallow submerged ridge separating a basin with two bodies of water, composed of granite and calc silicates, divides the scour basins into two lakes with equal surface elevations of 2,390 feet. Uh, this photo looks westward across Willow Lake to the metamorphic and granitic rocks exposed along the steep slope of Riddle Hill. Uh, this is an example of an outcrop of the granite bearing metamorphic rocks composing the sill that separates Willow from Granite Lake. And the lakes are not suitable for fish. The chemistry is wrong, but that doesn't mean there aren't inhabitants. Bathymetric uh, map of Granite Lake. Uh, notice that the deepest part of the lake basin is located on the, the northwest side of the lake, coincident with a chemically weathered contact between basalt and granite. And the 112 foot hole depth and steep sides is consistent with a cult formed cataract. So here we have the relevant geologic features within the 2000 foot wide scour channel partly occupied by granite lake. Here's the hole, it's in the basalt. And we have the metamorphic rocks up here, decomposed granite up here. Looking at Silver Lake, again, location. And last one we're gonna do is Meadow Lake over here, just south of Four Lakes. The Four Lakes, uh, the town is named after our meadow, willow, granite, and Silver Lake. Geology along the north half of Silver Lake. Once again, we have basalt on one side and granite and basement uh, metamorphic rocks on the other side. A bathymetric map of Silver Lake. Once again, the deepest point is skewed toward the west side of the lake along with the columnar basalts. The fresh appearance of the colonnades above the lake waters and closely spaced contours below the surface suggest a cliff of basalt undercut by the flood flows toppling the colonnades, which broke apart along the numerous horizontal fractures and were swept down flow. At the south end of the lake is a thick debris fly a field of broken basalt. Our orthophoto map of central Silver Lake showing the relevant geologic features within the 1700 foot wide lake basin. Note the bend of the lake uh, just to the east of Conjugate Lake, which right here, uh, within the medical lake fracture zone I talked about earlier. So it's one little bit of sinuosity is within the fracture zone. Meadow Lake is situated near the north end of an alluvial lacustrine filled lake basin formed in a basalt filled channel bordered by basement rock and flood gravels. And here's the geologic map, published geologic map of Meadow Lake. Basement rocks here and here, this brownish color is basalt. And then this is flood gravels and marsh deposits. Do these observations apply to other local lakes? Let's look at Fish Lake and you tell me. 
Fish Lake, just a few miles north of Cheney along the Cheney Spokane Road, lies within a county park and trailhead that runs along the east side of the lake. As you stand at the trailhead parking lot and look across the existing railroad to the east, you will immediately notice that Fish Lake is perched well above the through going flood channel. This is unique, at least I've never seen this anywhere else along the flood path. So what is the explanation of this oddity? You will also notice that Fish Lake occurs within two separate rock lakes, similar to those elongated scour lakes in the Four Lakes to Medical Lake area. The north end of Fish Lake is situated in the very eastern terminus of the Belt Supergroup, right over here, uh, it's, which is composed of quartz-rich metasedimentary rocks forming a ridge which includes Prosser and Needham Hills off to the north. The rest of Fish Lake was scoured out of the overlying basalt, which is ex also exposed along the highway. A computer generated river flow where the main channel flow is laterally separated from two eddy vortex zones over here. We envision a similar situation existed at Fish Lake where a basalt bedrock ledge separated the main channel flow from the Fish Lake Basin. The separation of the two pothole depressions within the lake is a rock blade. Uh, you'll notice that there are two scour basins separated by a rock blade, which is visible when the water is very low. I think the reason there are two scour basins within a relatively limited area is that two colts spinning in opposite directions in the weathered zone between the basement and basalt carve the two parallel scour pools within a counterclockwise eddy current. I finish my talk tonight with an oddity in our survey of local rock lake basins. The arcuate-shaped Audubon Lake is located at the head of Crab Creek, whose drainage is to the west of the Cheney Palouse Scabland Tract, and therefore shouldn't be part of my talk. However, Audubon Lake has some rather unique qualities that makes it one of my favorite stops in our IAFI field trips heading west on US Highway 2. The Audubon Lake Wildlife Preserve covers 427 acres on the east side of State Route 231, north of Reardon, Pay parking lots with restrooms are built on both sides of the lake. Audubon Lake occupies a scour channel that was a headwater divide to three separate drainages. The unique triple divide Scablin once drained into Deep Creek to the west, to the east, Crab Creek to the west, which is its only drainage now, and Spring Creek to the north, up this way. Flood gravel deposited with giant current dunes filled the head of Spring Creek drainage right in here. This is the most recent published geologic map of Audubon Lake. Note there is only basalt bedrock depicted. The rest is either loss or flood deposits. From this, you would have to assume that bedrock geology was basalt and that the colonnades exposed in the cliff just north of the lake were plucked apart and transported down the Crab Creek drainage channel. What is somewhat surprising is Audubon Lake Scabland Channel remains scoured with only small pothole lakes and while sand and gravel filled the low channel divide occupied by Audubon Lake. Remember that the giant current dunes were formed along the waning stage of the last flood flow to occupy this triple divide drainage system. The answer lies in the flow dynamics surrounding the transition between high and flow regimes and must await until a future talk. My husband and I made a detailed geologic map of the rear and east and west quadrangles over a decade ago and recent exposures of decomposed granite on the north side confirmed our suspicion that Audubon Lake is located at the very northern end of a basement ridge surrounded by basalt. Geology has played a now familiar role in the location of Audubon Lake, although chemical weathering between the basalt and granite was geographically extensive, it was not particularly deep. Thus, the lake bottom is fairly shallow and level. And here's an aerial view, the giant current dunes over here, granitic rock here, basalt scab land here. Another view, same sort of thing, different angle. So summary of lake geomorphology, cataract lakes include clear fish, granite and Williams. Gradual sloping mid-channel scour lakes include badger, medical and silver. Shallow non-scour hole lakes are meadow, west medical and willow. Hypothesis testing. The great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. Thomas Huxley said that. So let's test our uh, hypothesis with observation. Basic scientific methodology is simply this. 
put forth an explanation of her conundrum and then test it by trying to falsify it. Falsification can take the form of additional field observations or lab work. For example, let's observe Olson Hill. Olson Hill is another granite hill surrounded by basalt, just like Hospital Hill, but no flanking lakes. Why? Why doesn't it have lakes? Could this spot falsify our hypothesis? So let's first look at the geology. We've seen this map before, we'll use it again. Note that the interval between granite and basalt right up here in this area is not eroded out to form a lake filled rock basin. In fact, the north south trend of Silver Lake bends to the northeast across the weathered interval instead of within it. Could it be that this area is not that deeply weathered and therefore more resistant to flood erosion? Well, looking closer to uh, Olson Hill, water well logs drilled through this area uh, reveal that the chemical weathering zone saprolite along the granite basalt contact is both extensive and deep. Almost 275 feet deep of clay and decomposed granite. Therefore, the similarity of the geology rules it out as a causative factor. Looking at it in the form of an orthophoto, the big question is why didn't the flood water scour out the saprolite depression through here to form a linear lake like Medical Lake just one and a half miles to the southwest? Since the geology is virtually the same and the flood direction probably wouldn't be that different in such a small area, the answer must be in flow dynamics, mainly a change in flow intensity. An increase in flood speed causes an increase in incision but what could cause this to happen in the lakes area, but not in the adjacent West Plains? Uh, again, this map uh, by Bruce Bjornstadt uh, showing flood flow pathways between Cheney and Medical Lake. When the floodwaters crossing the West Plains was diverted down south down the Cheney Palouse Scavland tract, the flow became subdivided into several channels between the basement hills. This resulted in constricting each channel flow and increasing acceleration with depth, the Venturi effect mentioned earlier, allowing cult development and rock basin formation. The Olson Hill conundrum, that is two sites with identical geology, one forming rock basin lakes and the other not, actually does not invalidate the hypothesis, but instead provides proof positive that flow hydrodynamics is the primary factor in rock basin lake development. You'll notice that it's not constricted around Olson Hill. It's north of the area of the constrictions. So all the observations in our study of the lakes located in the northern portion of the Cheney Palouse Scavland tract support our original hypothesis that the quote Missoula flood flow hydrodynamics dictated whether rock basin lakes would form either by unidirectional or helical flow, while geology was the major factor with respect to location and geomorphology of the larger pothole and linear lakes. If you have any questions or suggestions, you may email me at elmacullum at ew.edu. So that's the end of the story and the end of the talk.